The situation is at the moment we have more than 5.1 million Ukrainians who were forced to leave their homelands since the beginning of Russia's invasion on February the 5th. And the question tonight is how are Ukrainian war refugees forced to leave their country welcomed in neighboring countries? The three journalists, the two who are there with us at the moment, you met Ukrainian refugees in your respective country, as well as inhabitants who often make up for the, the insufficient commitment of the government despite announcements. So we're thanking you very warmly for your participation tonight. I would Thanks. start, uh, first of all, with, uh, with you, Georgi. Uh, you are uh, so a Hungarian journalist, you're based in Brussels at the moment, you co-founded the specialized website Eurologus, and you work regularly for various independent Hungarian media outlets. So I will start uh, with you and then I will present you Fabian when I ask you the, the question. So in, in each country, civil society is massively committed in welcoming your Ukrainian refugees, I would like to know uh, whether it comes to you as somehow a surprise in a country where Viktor Orban has always been an anti-immigrant uh, leader and, and has carried on with the rhetoric and, and policies, anti-immigrant policies. So how come is this welcoming uh, different this time? Uh, thanks for the invitation, Catherine. It's good to be with you again. Um, to be honest, uh, I'm not very surprised about the Hung general Hungarian reaction. First of all, because um, if we historically, if we look at Hungary, Hungarian population was always a very, uh, very um, uh, multicultural society. So because it was never one single uh, um, nation in the sense that uh, we had in, in, within the Hungarian Empire lived uh, a lot of Croatians, Romanians, people from Transylvania, from Ukraine. Uh, so there was like the Russians, there were Germans, a lot of Germans, the Hungarian uh, aristocrats uh, in general until the early, late 19th century, they spoke German, for example. So the, 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 the multicultural nature of, of the Hungarian uh, society is by no means it's a surprise. What you refer to is a, a, a fear-mongering campaign that the Hungarian government you created in 2015 and generated. Uh, I mean, I'm not saying that I don't want to hide that in Hungary there's no um, there's no nationalist tendencies or there's no hatred than xenophobia against uh, xenophobia uh, at, at some level. But most of what outside Hungary perceived uh, as the, the hatred campaign against migrants and asylum seekers in 2015 and, and afterwards was, was politically generated and mostly fake in the sense that people played on the fear of Hungarians and of course the government was ready to exp explore that, uh, that opportunity and use it for, its, for, for strengthening its powers and make sure that we can have as oppressive regulations and rules as we can and we, we made into these fights with the European in the European Court of Justice and so on and so forth. I don't want to detail too much, but uh, it's not uh, it's not black and white that the Hungarians mm. dislike uh, uh, helping and they, they they don't show solidarity. In general, there were several occasions where Hungarian civil society showed large uh, um, openness, a big openness towards towards supporting uh, coming people coming from neighboring countries. For example, in Romania, when the situation was really bad in the end of the 80s, the, a lot of uh, Romanian Hung uh, uh, and also Hungarians living in Transylvania came to Hungary, which was also uh, uh, gesture of, of uh, generosity, but there were other other occasions in the past. So, uh, in this regard, I'm not surprised. What the, the but what we saw in the first few weeks of uh, in self organized civil society help in Hungary that's pretty amazing in the sense of very good to see, very positive. It was was tons of Facebook groups, all kinds of uh, uh, all kinds of social media groups where people try to organize different aspects of supporting, helping to, for driving people, uh, gave, uh, giving food. And until still until today, for example, accommodation in Hungary for, for Ukrainian migrants is basically only available through private private uh, mm -hmm. aid, private humanitarian support. The government doesn't support, doesn't give any 
uh, accommodation to to uh, to those coming to the uh, fleeing Ukraine to Hungary. Despite many announcements. Mm, yes, but uh, we can we can go to this later. I think. later. I, I, okay. I think I conclude now, and uh, there's a lot of you other carry on. aspects. Okay. Yes, uh, if you don't mind. Okay, uh, Fabien Perrier. So Fabien, you're an independent journalist. You're based in Athens. You're a correspondent for Le Soir in Belgium. You also work for Liberation in Paris, Le Temps in Switzerland, Alternative Economic in France, and other European outlets. Maybe you want to add some of them. I forgot. But you, and you're also your press secretary general. So the, the question now to you is in Greece, uh, as you wrote for Vox Europe, there is a very significant and large uh, Ukrainian diaspora, diaspora uh, has been there for a long time. And, and the country is a tradi traditional refuge to Ukrainian refugees uh, due to this historical lie. So how do today do the, the population welcome refugees? Is it only the diaspora? Is it also some um, Greek people who are not linked to Ukraine? And uh, I know you met, as you wrote, many refugees together with a photographer. And I uh, would like to know whether, how do you feel they, they are being welcomed in Greece and, and uh, in which part do they mainly settle in? Is it, is it mainly in, in, in Athens or do they go uh, in other place, to other places, islands maybe? So the floor is, is yours. Well, first of all, <clears throat> thank you very much for the invitation. Um, and uh, okay, to it's a very difficult question to to answer because first of all, the Greek migration to the Ukrainian migration to Greece has a link with the Greek migration to Ukraine or to the former uh, place where now Ukraine is. You we must have in mind that. Uh, since the antiquity, Ukraine had Greek roots in a way. Then at different times, the Greek uh, uh, people went to Ukraine. And so that the, we have real link that continue to exist in now. For example, I met in Athens, a family uh, who is now living in Greece, but the uh, 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 grand parents and even more the roots of the of the family of the Greek family in Ukraine comes from 1786 so more than if I'm not wrong 200 years uh, ago so this is the first reason so there there is a Greek minority living in Greece and due to this fact the link between Greece and Ukraine are very um, deep even today. This is the first uh, thing I would like to, to answer. The second thing I would like to answer is that um, after the fall of the uh, uh, of the uh, wall uh, of the, uh, of the UDSSR, um, a lot of uh, 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 Ukrainian people were looking for a job and came to Greece. So we have different waves of migration to Greece and the people continue to live in Greece or they continue to have link in, in Greece. For example, they get married with a Greek people. They have uh, children who are living part of time in Greece or are studying in Greece, even if the parents get back to, to Ukraine. So in this, let's say, global picture, we can understand that uh, Greece was for a part of the Ukraine people, a good place to find a refuge. Where do they live exactly? This is a very good question. I'm not able to answer it in a way because what I can explain you that what they do when they arrive in Athens, what they do when they arrive for example, for example, in Thessaloniki, due to the connection I explained before, most of the time when they arrive in, in uh, Athens, family is waiting for them and they go with the family to the to flats in Athens or in the suburbs of Athens. Some of them go to Poleponese or go to um, uh, let's say to the north of, of uh, Athens, but most of them, they go in their family. 
And if you do remember what I explained a few minutes before, it means that they go where the family is settled right now. If the Ukrainian <clears throat> sorry, family is working, for example, for the woman uh, as a nurse for elder people uh, working, for example, in Peloponnese, so they go in the place, in the city, or even in the village where the family is. Okay. The second point, which is quite important, is that the Greek government has said that they will uh, offer some places for Ukrainian people. What do they do? As you may remember, in between 2015 and let's say 2018, 19, Greece was living a refugee crisis, so-called crisis. So they have camps which are not used anymore for some of them, and they have tried to renew them for the Ukrainian families, arriving without any link to particular families in Greece. But the point is that when I meet the people who should go in this camp, most of them, they don't want. They say, it's not for us. It's not acceptable for us to be in this kind of camp. And let me add something. Uh, I asked the Greek government to visit one of these camps. I'm uh, still waiting for the answer to visit it. Mm. And I asked this, answer, this question for uh, the article written for Fox Europe, so at the end of March, if I do remember, and I, we are at the beginning of May, and I, have, I haven't get any answer, so any permission to visit one of these camps. Do you suspect why? I mean, are there other journalists, uh, correspondents who are asking themselves the same question? I, I, I'm not sure that a lot of, I, I don't know about my colleagues, mm. but I'm not sure that, uh, a lot of journalists asked for many reasons. Um, and uh, what I can imagine that uh, the Greek government is making a very big uh, communication on the new hotspots, but this is another issue. We'll probably come back to, the, to that mm -hmm. uh, later. But they may probably they don't want to show what was what is happening now in this camp that mean how what was what were the condition of people living in this camp before the new camp we will discuss it later okay thank you uh, fabian so no of course that, that was a question i had of course since you both uh, investigated and wrote the article uh, do you have uh, figures up to date or more up to date figures maybe since we published the articles on Fox Europe uh, both of you so first of all uh, yeah, Georg, Georgi I'm sorry not to pronounce your name properly maybe you could say it once again for all of us so <laughs> George is totally George is totally fine <laughs> it's fine okay so if you want to go ahead uh, uh, if you want no, jump in, no, no, feel, feel free to do it. It's okay. Oh, it's, okay. I felt like Fabian didn't finish his thought or like whatever. No, no, I, I, think, I, I, think it I did. couldn't hear you anymore. So I was thinking. Oh, I see. <laughs> okay. So the question was the latest, the, 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 how the situation has evolved uh, in, in both countries and as we, we got with the, the, you know, the refugees. Uh, coming in Hungary and in Greece, whether I mean, you, you have later, later, uh -huh. latest figures or new figures or... Well, I can put this in context okay. if you want, yes, if please. that helps. Um, well, the situation is that um, in Hungary, the, the latest figures are over, what is it, 450, wait, I can tell exactly, as of yesterday, 545,000 people have uh, left Ukraine th and entered Hungary. But, and this is very important, uh, according to informal sources, UNHCR sources and other um, other experts and also police sources, most of, I mean, this is a rough estimate, but at least 80% of the people who entered Hungary from Ukraine uh, 
uh, are not anymore in Hungary. Uh -huh. This means most of them goes to Austria. Some and and I mean primarily they go to Austria and Germany because those are the most uh, accepting and friendly uh, uh, in their eyes, I assume. And, but there's a lot of people going to Scandinavia to and some to the UK, and uh, I mean this is what we hear. Uh, and um, why this is important because the Hungarian government wants to show to the outside of your to the out the, the, to the rest of the European Union that they are super uh, open and they are super welcoming, which is partly true there is uh, or by now there is a uh, mm, service organized even though i mentioned earlier the accommodation which is not available through uh, official sources <coughs> only through um, private um, help but uh, uh, this means that hungary has some uh, some uh, leverage that it uses it says there are more people in hungary than they are actually in the country and uh, also there's like a, what is a key aspect of this is that according to this emergency regulation of the eu how they, these uh, emergency situations should be handled and then what kind of uh, services the the the, um, the um, migrants uh, should get it uh, explicitly says details about registration the way automatic registration of these people coming uh, for three years but this is not the case in hungary and therefore there is a lot of supposed to be registered people but they simply don't even go through the system they just go over to germany or austria as i mentioned to other members mm. eu member states and that also uh confuses the figures and makes uh, makes us to see the less clear picture of what's actually happening in hungary having said this i'm not saying that there's not a huge uh, uh, migration pressure on the country and there are like specialized trains going to to budapest from uh, from the border uh, region um, um and there is a uh, tremendous help from the civil society there's a lot of quite a lot of services available uh, but there are also clear, uh, there's clear evidence of things missing. So, for example, of it's a, it's a no-brainer that uh, normally a country uh, that welcomes the refugees from a crisis zone, which is currently a war zone, there should be some form of psychological support, for example, which is absolutely non-existing in Hungary. Mm. But this is just one example of the things that mm. supposed to be there, but they are not in real in on the ground. Uh, uh, yeah, on the on the ground uh yeah so this is this is basically what's the what's the current situation in hungary if you want to see i checked the latest figures and there are like uh 10 that wait for the yesterday there was um six six to ten thousand people come uh every day uh still to hungary from ukraine that's the latest figure but transition some of them yeah, yeah most of them i mean we don't yeah, have a clear them. picture that's yeah. why i said because of the confusing hmm. way of reg they are registered yeah. And we don't know how long they stay, even if they transition. No, the, this, the, the 80 percent is a rough estimate, but we yeah. heard it from multiple sources. OK, okay. Fabian, go ahead. Sorry, I was yeah. like. Uh, so thank you, Fabian, for your up to date figures, if you have any. I have, but I can see that you like to ask very hard question or question which are very hard to answer because. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> um, at the same time, it's almost the same for Greece. So what we know is that before the war, uh, the Greek minority in Ukraine was around a thousand, uh, 100,000 uh, people. So the big question is, what are they going to do? Are they all coming to Greece or not? Till now, they are not all coming to Greece. Uh, this is a first part of the answer. The second part is that we have 30,000 Ukrainian people living in Greece before the war. All my contacts in Greece, in the Ukrainian uh, diaspora, say that they are waiting for four Ukrainian people for one Ukrainian living in Greece. That means that Greece should have a uh, hundred, around a hundred 20,000 people, uh, ref uh, Ukrainian refugees coming in the next months. Till now, what is sure is that we have 22,000 Ukrainian refugees in Greece. That's what the government, that's what the data show. But 
What we don't know is how many of them go to be registered. First mm -hmm. uh, point. Second point, a lot of them, they don't even want to, re to get registered because they think that they will go back to Ukraine in some weeks. That's why they think. So they come to protect themselves, mm -hmm. but they don't want, in fact, to stay for a long time in Greece. And a part of them who are now in Greece and probably the one who are registered are the one who think that they cannot go back to Ukraine. Who are they? They, first of all, the Ukrainian people, the Greek, uh, the Ukrainian people from the Greek minority. That means that they are coming, first of all, from Mariupol. Of course, it would be very difficult for them to go back uh, to Mariupol. We all know the situation of Mariupol now. Uh, the second very typical uh, families in this case who don't want to go back to, to, to Ukraine are the ones who are, let's say, half Ukrainian, half Russian. I met a very interesting family. Uh, the mother was born, the grandmother was born in Ukraine. The grandfather was born in uh, uh, Russia in the UDSSR time. Then they have children who get married with, for example, a Ukrainian one or a, a Russian one. They decided to live in Kiev, for example, and now they don't feel comfortable to go back to Ukraine and they don't feel comfortable to go back to Russia. What are they going to do? All what they are explaining me is that, first of all, they hope that peace will arrive as soon as possible. But secondly, that even if peace is arriving, they are not going to go back to Ukraine because they fear that a kind of uh, xenophobia would exist against them. Mm -hmm. um, and OK. I think it's very important to have it in mind because it shows that the data that we have now, probably they are not um, really clear about the situation which really exists in Greece, like in a lot of uh, mm -hmm. European countries, let's say, which have particular link to, 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 um, uh, to Ukraine. Okay, thanks. Um, just before I, I carry on with uh, another question, I just want to tell everybody listening to us that you're welcome to ask your question. You can't really ask them aloud, but you can write them in the chat and I will uh, read them for you. So please don't hesitate to, if you have uh, any questions for either of our guests. Um, I'm sorry that Oana Mozi doesn't, couldn't connect. So I'm not going to ask questions about Romania, but you can still, read the article that uh, Oana uh, wrote for, um, she, 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 she investigated with a, a number of journalists, of colleagues for Our Europe, and she, she spent some time you know, speaking to refugees also in Romania, where the welcome was also very big and coming particularly from social society. So a bit like in Hungary and maybe like in Greece and other countries, we see that the 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 the, the, the is basically the help comes from people from from the population and from civil society associations or, or local families diaspora and not so much from from governments. So, but of course, I can't. You can read the article, but I can't really uh, say what she was going to say. So I don't really know. But um, as far as the uh, the next question is concerned. Um, I, I, I think it's interesting to see some that uh, in, in all of these countries, a number of uh, Ukrainian refugees, of course, hope to go back. And my next question was, what do you know of the, the links that refugees kept or are keeping with the members of the families or friends who couldn't come or had to stay in Ukraine? Like, for example, men, uh, partners who had to fight if they're I think up to 60 years old, they, they, are, they are stuck, uh, even if they wanted to leave. And I don't know how many want to actually 
fight, but do you, do you have any insight from the uh, investigation you did when you talked to people, both of you? Uh, have you heard in particular about uh, examples of maybe resistance from afar or help that these refugees are trying to, to give to people who stayed? So either of you... Well, uh, the, this drama that you refer to, especially because of the first two or three days, there was this, no, no um, ban on men leaving the country. And after that, there were a lot of scandals on the, on the, and, and sadness on the border because some, some men reached the border, but they were not allowed through. I also heard about stories unofficially where they bribed the, the uh, border guards and then went through the border. That's also the case because the Hungarians, of course, let them in. It's just that the Ukrainians themselves mm. who, who don't. Um, so, uh, and in general, a lot of um, um, interviews or personal statements uh, from people who crossed to Hungary uh, referred to this, this, uh, the sadness that fathers and grandfathers and young men are, um, are um, stuck in Ukraine and defending their country and their land. Um, but um, otherwise, I, I, I don't know if this was something that, uh, that, um, <clears throat> that we uh, um, heard too much about. This, not lately, to be honest. Not lately, okay. And Fabien? Uh, what are the links between the refugees and the members of the family state in Greece, in uh, Ukraine? Um, okay, first of all, uh, as you mentioned before, uh, the men, they couldn't go out of, uh, of Ukraine. What is very interesting is that the ones who are in Greece now are the ones who, for example, are sailors. That means that they were out of Ukraine before the war for 10, ten months or one year on, on, in a ship. And they want to come back. They are working for uh, uh, um, uh, Greek companies. They want to go, they, they, they come back to, to Athens, to Piraeus, and they are stuck. But they are not considered as refugees. Oh, I see. Because they went out of Ukraine before the war, and it's a very big uh, issue for them because they have a lot of difficulties to find a place to, uh, where to stay. They ha they don't know what they are going to do. Uh, this is the first point. Second uh, is that a uh, lot of people uh, I met continue, of course, to have link with the family when they are in cities where they can have access to internet or to the communication or, or meaning of communication. And for the woman, I do remember a woman who was really crying because it was three days that she couldn't have any phone call with her uh, husband. And it's a disaster for them. It's a pity because they, they fear a lot. They have no connections, I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, and um, you were asking about the resistance too. And I will not mention the family, of course, but even from Greece, we can see that there are kinds of uh, resistance which are implementing for the Ukrainian refugees. For example, through internet, they are hacking so some uh, uh, Russian companies are trying to, I don't know if they manage, I'm not good enough, but <laughs> they say that they are, they, they are hacking. And I think it's interesting because it shows that uh, in this war, which is, to my opinion, a kind of total and global war, uh, we have new ways of fighting mm -hmm. and new ways of doing a kind of resistance. The other kind of 
I don't know if the world would be resistant, but what is interesting in any case is the solidarities which is existing between the Ukrainian, inside of the Ukrainian uh, uh, um, community in Greece. They are the one who first of all decided to, to build a center to help the refugees. Uh, they are the one who collected at the beginning the food, the um, uh, clothes and so on, to send to families arriving in Greece without a lot of stuff or to send to, to, to Ukraine. Uh, and um, another uh, interesting point on this kind of uh, uh, resistance or solidarity, maybe it's better. In the article for um, uh, uh, Vox Europe, I mentioned a concert which was an international concert organized by the U U Ukrainian uh, minority, uh, but in Greece, we could see that association organized one week after this concert, if I do remember, a huge concert in the center of Athens with the best artists of Greece coming to sing and to appeal for peace. And it's very interesting that it happened in this country due to the uh, particle, let's say, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, feeling uh, of Greek people with NATO, with, uh, okay, this is part of the hi Greek history, but it's very important that it happened in Greece uh, and that the people go to the street for the peace and are acting for the peace. I don't know if you have seen the, the film of Costa Gavras, Z, mm -hmm. but this is one of the issue, in fact, of the film. And Z, the, the, the part, the, the, the very big point of the film shows that it happened in the streets that militants for the peace are biting by the police. Mm. So it was very important to organize and to, to show that Greek people are helping and supporting peace when the Greek government decided, for example, to send arms. We had okay. similar things in Hungary. There, was a okay. there were several protests in favor of Ukraine and supporting them in their efforts for in the keep preserving independence. And uh, there was also some scandalous mini, mini, um, mini demo, mini protest uh, in favor of Russians or something. It was super weird. So against the, the Ukrainian self-sustaining self, self independence or something. So it was very confusing. Uh, and uh, and since the Hungarian public media is so um, propagandistic, they they really distort these stories, and they have they have reportages that are far from truth about the numbers and sizes and supports, and, and especially how they are presented in the media, particularly in the pro-government uh, news portals and uh, newspapers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, thanks. It's, just yeah. Sorry. I, I was just wondering if you want, if if I could just jump in with the uh, because we talked about perception of of uh, support and help, and I wanted to quote yes, this. Sure. Uh, there is this new actually it's coming. It came out today or to the, the last couple of days. Uh, uh, you, um, Eurobarometer on uh, flash flash Eurobarometer about uh, from Eurostat about Europeans' attitudes towards Ukraine and uh, their. Um, they are join them join their perspective to join the European Union, uh, solidarity uh, if they are willing to cut back on energy use and so on and so forth. And what is striking for me is that there's this one. There's one of the questions says Ukraine should join the EU when it's ready. Question. The, and the, one of the low actually it's the lowest of Hungary, the lowest level of, who to totally agrees. 
are Hungarians. And then that we, even we totally agree, totally agree, 15% and 33% tend to agree, it's still the lowest of all the member states of the okay. 27. Uh, and second in the line is Bulgaria, third is Luxembourg, fourth is Austria. And the top, the most supportive ones are Portugal and Estonia and Latvia. Okay. And Poland also, sorry, Poland is the fourth. Which yeah, there was this question. Yeah, so there's weird. no e what for, for me is striking is there's no east-west divide in this. Mm, it's also clear cut. Because it's very of very often, I mean, the idea with European politics for from a high perspective, from Brussels perspective for over 50 well, around 15 years now. And it's very rarely the case that you don't see clear east-west, north-west, north-south, or some, some very typical div divide. And in this one, it's all confusing, <laughs> for me at least. Okay, so thanks for mentioning this study. Uh, You're welcome. Uh, there was uh, this question that uh, Georg or George uh, Tsugavu asked in, in, the, in the chat, will the attitude towards refugees will change if the war lasts for longer? So. Of course, we don't know how long the war is going to last, but whether this very welcoming and heartedly, uh, wholeheartedly um, uh, solidarity with it. I assume, yeah, sorry, Fabian, go ahead. You were raising your hand. Directly, you have seen, I did it directly. <laughs> 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 uh, yes, um, I cannot tell. Uh, if it will change or not, but I can see what happened in the past in Greece. And I would like to underline the first point is that between 2015 and 2016, a million of migrants, uh, of refugees arrived in Greece. Uh, and at the very beginning, it was a huge movement of solidarity towards the, the migrants. Everybody do remember what happened on Lesbos Island, that they were about to get the Nobel Prize for the help that, <clears throat> sorry, that they gave to the, to the refugees and so on. And we must see, say that it was a huge help of Greek people towards all the refugees. But slowly, slowly, when you have a lot of people coming in a country which is in crisis, it's very easy, especially for some far-right parties, to say that the refugees, the migrants, are the cause of the problems that you have, or that they increase the problems that you have. And at that time, the, uh, uh, when the population, as the population understood that a part of the refugees were about to stay in Greece, the feeling, let's say, towards the refugees went to a feeling against the refugees. And I think it will not happen in the same way with the Ukrainian refugees in Greece for many reasons. The first one is that the two countries have the orthodox religion as the orthodoxy as a religion. Um, around 75, 74% of the Greek population, like of the Ukrainian population, considers the, the, this religion as a part of their identity. So this is uh, very important to have it in mind because they feel, the two, the two population feel more close together. But even if I say that, personally, I think that if the problem that we see, the, con the, the consequences of the uh, uh, war in Ukraine after the invasion of uh, Russia uh, continue to increase, I think that the Ukrainian refugees will be considered probably as a part of the reason why we in Greece have problems increase of uh, the price of gas, of oil, and so on. We all know what's going, what's happening now uh, as consequences of this war. So we, it will probably not be so, so uh, hard or so, um, let's say so hard like in 2016 and after, but I really fear 
that even if the numbers are lower uh, than in 2, 2, 7, uh, 15, and 16, the refugees will be considered as part of the Greek problem. Like a traditional scapegoats, of course, yeah. Thank you. I'm asking uh, another question. It's uh, uh, coming from Paula Kirby. Do you have any information about what Ukrainian refugees in Greece and Hungary think about the way uh, President Zelensky is handling the situation? Who would like to answer first? I think uh, if you don't listen to the propaganda main main uh, government news news sites who are really making a big favor of to Putin all the time still, then uh, people have a very realistic view about uh, Zelensky and the way he defends his country and the way he steps up for independence and everything else and how and how, how what an amazing skills he has when it comes to communication and political speech writing i mean not probably his team but the way he's he's using always the right arguments and he's very persuasive in his in his public appearances uses excellently symbols so it's it, that that part is uh, that, that goes through to the hungarian uh public um and they see they have a, a very similar view about him i think on him sorry Okay, uh, thank you. Um, uh, also, George. <laughs> no, I was just, uh, I also wanted to, to maybe bring in, in, in our conversation, the, 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 the way you work uh, as journalists, especially when, you, when you're meeting people, you know, in such a difficult situation, you're meeting refugees and meeting also inhabitants welcoming them and I would like to ask you both of you uh, what are what are what were the most striking the most the strongest moments interviewing refugees or families or, or witnessing civil society solidarity and maybe a, a question uh, that derives from that is do you think it's changing maybe the way it's changing something in the way, either in the welcoming or the understanding of the situation, it's a difficult question to answer. But it's more your personal work and approach as journalists that I'm asking now. Okay, can I before I, I can answer to this question? But I would like to to add something to the previous question about the uh, how the Ukrainian refugees. Sure. Sorry. Yeah. No, no, no problem. Um, and because I wouldn't say I totally disagree with uh, uh, George, but I disagree. <laughs> this is uh, why we live in democracies. Sure. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I'm all curious about why you disagree on what exactly. Uh, I disagree because of what I heard by the by the refugees themselves. Mm -hmm. And I would say that around 80% of the refugees I met in Greece didn't vote for Zelensky, nor for the other one at the last election. So most of them, they think that now he's handling quite well, but all of them say 80%, I would say maybe 70, but the vast majority say that he became, let's say, a kind of leader as the war was declared. But at the same time, most of them told me he didn't uh, understood that we were about to have a war, even if we had a war in other part of Ukraine since uh, 2014. So they, they are not, uh, let's say, they don't appreciate him so much. It's not my feeling at all by talking with the refugees, first point. Then... Um, Sorry, but I was talking about Hungarians' perception of Zelensky and not Ukrainians who left the country. Ah, and, uh, okay, okay. No, no, sorry, it's just a small clarification. Yeah, and it's quite different, of course, you yeah. know. Okay, yeah. because I think the, 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 uh, the question was about Ukrainian refugees in Greece. That's why maybe I... 
Uh, I couldn't hear very well the beginning of your answer. But in any case, that's what the, the Ukrainian refugees say about Zelensky. Then you have the question of what the Greek people think about Zelensky. And we must keep in mind that Greece has a very difficult, uh, has a very big problem with NATO due to the fact that there is a, a, a fight with Turkey and there is the issue of Cyprus. And in 1974, as the uh, 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 Turkish uh, army went to, to Cyprus, NATO didn't uh, intervene because uh, the two, the two Greece and Turkey were part of NATO. So when you have not so far from Greece, a president who is asking to enter the NATO, a part of the population don't see that with a very good eye. And then Zelensky has made a very big mistake. I was looking for the date and I will tell it to you because I found it. <laughs> uh, uh, probably on the 7th of April 2000 of this year, he was talking to the to the Vuli, to the uh, Greek uh, parliament, and after his speech, he asked two Ukrainian of the Greek minority in Ukraine to to have a small uh, 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 conversation, to have a small uh, speech, to to have a small speech. Uh, with the, uh, uh, at the Vuli too, so via, via uh, video conference, of course. But one of them was a member of the um, bataillon. I can't remember the, the word in English, bataillon. Fight or uh, no? Um... As of. As fight, fighting unit. Oh. Yes, of the oh. as of unit, which is close to the neo Nazi, as we know. So what could have been a very good, let's say, uh, way to flatter the uh, uh, Greek nationalism went to a very big mistake of Zelensky. And to my opinion, and that's what I can see, in a population like the Greek one, who has already a very big problem with NATO, when you have someone who is handling this way, and when you know at the same time what is the history between Greece and um, what was the history of Greece during the Nazi uh, time, and what is the Greek problem with the neo Nazis, I think he made a very, very, very big mistake, a huge mistake, and that it has, it will have a lot of impact in the way how the Greek society is seeing the uh, conflict in Ukraine. And now I can't remember your other question, Catherine. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to comment on this, uh, Georgi, or not? No, okay. Well, the, the question was about, you know, the way you work as, as journalists and, and now because we have uh, seven minutes left of interpretation, uh, maybe I'm adding my, Another question, if you want to answer it as, you know, field working, field journalist, the question being, uh, of course, we, 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 we've read many, many accounts and, 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 and articles on a difference of treatment between refugees uh, in Ukraine to start with, and also maybe in the way uh, these refugees are being welcomed in the various countries, neighboring countries. So. If you, we can link either answer one or, or, or the two or link it as your personal experience, whether you've, uh, you've, um, have, you've had testimonies or whether you've witnessed some of this uh, difference of treatment and whether you were personally touched or by you know, uh, some of the interviews you did or some of the meetings. Your well, I, I, it's not fully in, in uh, it's just something I read today or yesterday it came across in the Hungarian media, which, which is, tells that the nature of humans or Hungarians doesn't change too much, is that in general Hungarians, uh, in Hungary there's a, 
significant hatred against Ro Roma uh, and Gypsy population, and um, they uh, um, and uh, now there was a new statistics that showed that those people coming from Ukraine migrants who are uh, Roma, they are not welcome as much as blonde, typical Ukrainian looking, uh, Slavic, sorry, Slavic looking uh, uh, people. So the, 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 the guts instinct that, that are present for a very long time in Hungary, they don't really change even when it comes to a war situation or a, or a crisis like the, the, the current humanitarian and, and human and um, dignity crisis. Sadly. Um, I think I wrote my first article on uh, refugees in Greece in 2011. Uh, at that time, it was people coming from uh, North Africa. They were parked in a camp, what they called the jungle with uh, self-organized tents uh, and they were ready to go out of Patras uh, at the e uh, west side of Greece through boats to Italy. Then we come to 2015 and one million of uh, refugees coming between March 2015 and March 2000. 16 to Greece. Most of them were passing through Greece, going to Germany, Sweden, uh, and Great Britain most of the time. It was the three first countries where they wanted to go. At the beginning, as I said, they were really welcomed because all the, pe all the Greek people understood, first of all, that they were going just to pass and not to stay. But as soon as they were staying, some parties, as I said before, were doing the best to destroy the kind of solidarity which was existing between the Greek population and the migrants. So, uh, and last time I was working on non-Ukrainian refugees uh, was uh, in 2000. Uh, not last time, but another very important experience as a journalist was in 2018 on board of the Aquarius uh, to, to, to see how it works with the uh, refugees coming from South Africa, uh, sub, um, Sub Saharan Africa to, to Europe. The very good thing with the uh, Ukrainian refugee crisis is that we could see that, in fact, Europe is ready to accept refugees. I think this is what we should keep in mind. We are ready to have them, and we have the possibility to give, to give them papers in a very short time. And I underline it exactly now, because at the same time, we can see in Greece that Frontex the uh, European agency, agency for the borders is really pushing back people in the sea, pushing back people at the Evros in the, uh, in the north of Greece, even if they put their life in danger. So it's very important to keep in mind that we are ready and able to accept human being and we shouldn't make any difference between the value of an Ukrainian guy, an Afghanistan, and a guy from Afghan or a woman from uh, France or wherever you want. 